Okay, good evening once again. I'm Dr. Iwara Ripo from the Department of Computer Science here at the University of Calabar. So I am here to take us on the first chapter of our introduction to computers, GSS 211. And the first chapter is the introduction to the course. And I'd like at this point to remind us that for the GSS course, we are answering two kinds of questions. GSS 211, which is Introduction to Computer, is answering the question, what are computers? And what can computers do? That's what GSS 211 is meant to answer that question. What are computer systems and what can they do? Now in the second semester, where we'll be doing computer applications. Now we'll be answering the question, how are computers able to do what we say computers can do in 211? So that you will answer those questions, the how question of the use of computers, you answer it in the lab. So basically for the first semester, we are practically telling ourselves, what are these things they call computers? What can they do? And in this first chapter, we will be looking at the following outline. We'll be looking at the general definition of a computer system. We'll be considering conditions that any device should satisfy before it is eligible to be called a computer system. We'll also be considering the characteristics of computers. What are the features of computers? Again, we'll look at what are the uses and the disadvantages of computers. Do computers really have disadvantages? Then we look at the historical developments of computers. So it helps us to know where we are coming from in the computer industry, where we are, and probably where we are headed. Thereafter, we'll look at the fundamental concept that has defined the way computers have been developed over time. And that is the concept of the stored program. Thereafter, we'll look at generations of computers who identify different technologies identifiable with different phases of computer development. Thereafter, we'll consider a categorization of computers called types of computers. And then we'll wrap up today's class with classes of computers. So I welcome once again. Now the question is, what is a computer? I know that several people have different meanings, different experiences, different things they want to say about computers and all that. But it's good to formally, as students, to formally have a general understanding of what a computer system is. A computer system is an electronic device that performs tasks, yes? What are these tasks? It performs calculations. It carries out storage. It reports its processing activities. And it does a host of other, other tasks and functions, but under the control of programs. So a computer does all these tasks under the guidance and control of programs. Then what are programs? What is a program? A program is a set of instructions that guides the operations of a computer system. So it is the programs that direct a computer on what to do. A computer cannot do anything except guided or instructed by a program. So computers perform all these tasks we have mentioned, but under sets of instructions, which we call the programs. Now, anytime we talk about a computer system, we are either talking about a computer system in terms of the hardware, which refers to the, the, the physical components of a computer system, those components of a computer system that we can feel and touch. Or we are talking about the set of working programs 
which we call uh, software. So computers can be talked about computer hardware or computer software. So the, the hardware is a physical component and the software is what brings life or identity to the hardware. Now we consider what conditions, what is the criteria, what criteria should a device fulfill to be called a computer system? One, it must be capable of accepting raw facts, unprocessed facts are called data. So that device must be capable of accepting raw facts from an input device. So these input devices include things like keyboard, the mouse, the light pen, the scanner. These are all input devices. So for any device to be called a computer system, that device should be able to accept unprocessed facts through this medium, any of these media, like keyboard, mouse, and all that we've all been used to them and been using them. The second thing is that that device that wants to be called a computer should be able to manipulate or process these raw facts, which we call data up there, automatically into a form that is different from the original input. What this means is that every time we, you sit on your keyboard, you try to work on the computer, you're typing things in a way you understand, in the human understandable form. But the computer doesn't work on it that way. The computer will be able to convert it into the binary coded representation, that is the ones and zeros. So we are saying that for any device to be called a computer, it should be able to manipulate this, uh, the, your input in human understandable uh, in the form you enter. And it should be able to change that form by itself within its system. That's what we call processing. Now, another thing is that that device should be able to store that data or information. You will agree with me that most of the time you work on a computer system not because you need the result immediately. You want to be able to get back to that result in the future. So for any device to be called a computer system, that device should be able to retain that information for future use. Additionally, that device should be able to produce results in a human understandable form. Let me explain to us what that means. If you sit on your email app, you enter your username and you enter your password. That is the normal English human understandable form. Now the system takes what you have entered and manipulates it to check against the database on whether you are qualified to use that email app or something. The time is processing is processing it as a series of zeros and ones. If your, for example, if your, your, your username is ID, it can represent I with about 16 or 32 ones and zeros. It can represent D the same way. And that information cannot be useful to the naked eye. It even confuse us. So for a device to be called a computer system, that device should be able to produce results in a way that you and I can understand. That's the fourth condition. Say the device should be able to produce results in a form that is understandable by humans. Final and the most important condition is that that device must be programmable. That means for any device to be called a computer system, that device should be able to receive instructions and be guided by that instruction. These instructions are what we call programs. So it's the most critical condition that we normally should check out for any device to be called a computer system. Now we consider characteristics of computers. Well, computers have high speed. You know, you remember that a computer, by its definition, is an electronic device. And because a computer is an electronic device, it operates at the speed of electricity. 
And when things operate at the speed of electricity, it means they can really, really go far at short time. So they operate at the speed of electricity. So a computer can, under a few minutes, what can take humans a whole lifetime to complete? A computer can complete it in a few minutes. For example, if they ask them, your entire class to sort, to organize and arrange in alphabetical order all the names and registration numbers of all the people who wrote jam in the, in the country, it can take your whole class several months, if not years, to be able to arrange millions of names in ascending order or descending order, depending on what you want to achieve. But with the high speed of computers, that can be achieved in very few minutes. So computers have the speed of electricity in the way they work. The second characteristic of computer is that they are highly accurate devices. If a computer is programmed correctly, a computer does not make mistakes. In all practical applications, computers can work error-free. They don't make mistakes. And then you ask me, what of the errors that we normally hear, oh, this is computer error. We normally, oh, this error came from the computer. And I can tell you that it is not because the computer malfunction. There are two people who are responsible for every computer error. The person who wrote the instructions for the computer to follow is called a programmer. Either he coded the wrong thing, or the person who is typing in data to operate it had entered wrong data. For example, in Nigeria, the, the mobilization, the age of mobilization is 30 years before you are mobilized for NYSE. If the programmer, for instance, had programmed the computer and as he was about to type 30 as a minimum age, because the zero and nine are the same place, are very close in the keyboard, and then he mistakenly pressed nine instead of zero. That program will allow even people who are up to 39 years, and people will scream, so this computer is not working properly, we say that we should abandon all these computer things. Or maybe you are the one who has been asked to enter data in the computer, and then you are entering somebody's name, instead of pressing, after pressing three, instead of pressing uh, zero, you press nine. Oh, the computer start reporting error, say this person is not qualified, say no, but this person is 30 years, and I put 30 years. So in those kind of situations, it's not the computer has, that has made the error, it is the human error. Now we look at the third characteristic, which is reliability. Because computers operate error-free, we can trust them with the most delicate of uh, tasks. Because if they cannot make mistakes for a given long period they have been assigned to do something, then we can trust them. And that is why now they are trusted to fly aircraft. An aircraft flies on autopilot close to 75% of the operations. And that's just computer software working. So it is because they can be relied upon. They are reliable. That's why computers can handle such sensitive ta tasks as what you find them being used now in heart surgeries, in monitoring patients' uh, heartbeat and all. It's because they are very reliable. They can count on the, 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 the correctness of computer operations. And the fourth characteristic is called versatility. That is to be versatile means that uh, something can be put to several uses. Of course, we all know now that we only try to check what areas of human endeavor that computers are not yet been deployed to handle. Otherwise, you cannot count areas where computers are already been deployed. In the olden days, you can simply count areas of operations where computers can be deployed. But now, you can only count areas where computers are not yet deployed because they are versatile, they are applied in almost every area of human endeavor. Areas that before now are not imaginable to be applied with computers. Now computers are running almost everything. So that is because they are versatile, they can be multitask, they can be put in multiple uses. 
Then you have the, the, the last but not the least uh, characteristic, which is high speed and quick, high storage and quick and, and quick retrieval. Now, what can fill a massive hall in terms of a conventional flat files? You can fill a massive hall. For example, you have close to 40,000 university students. Let's say you have all their files stored in a room. A massive hall can be filled to the brim with these students' files. But all that information can be stored in a flash drive, a pen drive like this, can store all that information with space even left. So that tells you the high capacity of storage computers possess. And because they have high capacity, they can store volumes of data that cannot be stored in terms of conventional documentations. Then in addition to that, computers, the speed of retrieving things from computers is incredible. For example, I'll give you an example that if we have like 40,000 students, no matter the level of arrangement, if you, have, you are asked to go and look for your file, when we're students, sometimes it takes us two weeks, you've not been able to find your file. But if we need this information now that most of this information is now electronic, just type in your matric number, say you want to register, you were in year one, you are now in year two, you want to register your courses, you just type your matric number. Depending on the speed of the computer where you're, that you're using, before you could leave your finger, sometimes your information is retrieved. So you can quickly retrieve information from computers than it is with manual access to information. And let's look at areas of application or uses of computers. We first take the health sector. Computers are now deployed in radiographic imaging, where they can take scan, uh, scan pictures of the brain, the human intestine, and every part of our internal body. It's computers that have been deployed to do all this imaging. And based on this imaging, computers can, working with uh, trained doctors, they can automatically do diagnosis of diseases. So in hospitals, computers can be used in general hospital administration. So in, in hospitals that are properly computerized, when you get at the entrance, instead of going to the records room like we find in some of our hospitals where they can take the hold and the patient can almost die, here you can just fill your, the patient's ID folder, which will be in the card that you are carrying. And then the file is available electronically and you can schedule a doctor's appointment even before coming. So you already know the consultant you are going to see before even reaching the hospital because computers have been deployed to handle all those scheduling and all that. Then computers are in direct drug inventory and disposition, disposition. Computers can be used to monitor inventory. So you cannot go to a hospital and say, okay, oh, let me check whether the drug is still there. No, they just put the drug code on the computer and it will tell the current status of the uh, quantities of that drug or medicine in the hospital. What of intensive care units? In intensive care units where people who are in critical conditions are monitored. If you keep human beings to count people's heartbeats, pulse rates that may be delicate to either affect a particular injection or to affect a discharge or depending on the complication of the situation. If you put a human being there, that human being may take a phone call, a phone call may come and may forget the number where he was, he or she was, and they can make mistake and that may lead to the death of that patient. But basically with computers now deployed to monitor all those things, we get reliable uh, data from that. The next, the, the, the second to the last but not the least application of computers is in telemedicine, where medical professionals can seek help, can also administer care to patients from any part of the world. For example, in the University of Calabar Teaching Hospital, a consultant can be looking at a patient's case and is not probably able to deal with that case, is not able to diagnose what is responsible. 
that consultant can connect to a telemedicine application and consult with other colleagues across the world. And those colleagues can even speak with the patient to know the conditions. And those colleagues can provide help across the world without traveling one inch out of where they are. So computers are used in telemedicine. What of in education? In education, computers are very useful for people with different levels of learning capabilities. As students, we have different levels of catching up with the teacher and catching up with the instructions that are given. That's why some are low, slow learners, some are fast learners. So a computer-aided instruction is an application that a computer software that helps people to be able to train, learn at their pace. So they can review the lecture, they can do it several times, they can do attend a, a continuous assessment, they can do a lot of things at their pace. Not the one that, oh, you are asking questions, the teacher will say, well, I've passed that thing, you're moving to another decision. No, with a computer-aided instruction, you learn at your pace. Now we have also computers in virtual learning like we are doing now. You are connected to this lecture from any part of the world and you are connected at the same level with any other person, whether they are in Nigeria or anywhere, you are connected to this lecture. We are using computers at all ends, whether you are using a phone, whether you're using a tablet or a conventional computer, these are all computer devices. So computers are useful now, especially with this pandemic, uh, the virtual learning has, taken, has, taken, has become the norm. So computers are indispensable here. General educational management, of course, we know in a, for example, the online registration is a form of deployment of computers. Resolve processing is all about use of computers. Even the projects, your student project you work on, data analysis and all that in the school are all part of computers in education. What of the banking sector? The banking sector is one of the biggest users of computer systems. If you go to the bank to cash money, you are simply interacting with information. So you they put all your information, your account number, and when they put your account number, your signature pops up for them to identify you because the information is stored in the computer. And then they look at the full passport on the computer system, look at your face to see whether you are the person. If you want to pay in money, they collect your money, but what they have simply done is to put the information in the computer and then you're, you receive an alert that your money has been credited. What of the ATM? When you go to the ATM machine, you put in your card, a computer is at the background. So that is why when you put a wrong pin, it will report to you that that pin is incorrect because the information about the pin is already stored in the computer. So when you put the, new, the, the information, it will check against what is in the computer and what is on your card and you report to you if it's faulty. So what of phone transfer, electronic phone transfer? Now people can stay in their rooms and either pay their fees in some universities where you can do online payment, or sometimes you can stay in your room and send money or receive money from your parents who could be abroad, who could be any part of the world. They make transfers to you. What is happening is that there's no fiscal cash movement. The only thing that is happening is that you, the information is being transferred across two ends. If they're sending you money, say from Abuja, the only thing that has moved across communication channels is the information. And then you receive alerts. The fiscal cash has not moved. So electronic fund transfer is an example of application of computers in the banking sector. Now in the statistical analysis, there's a lot, lot, lot of analysis that you cannot do manually. For example, if they conduct a census in Nigeria today, it is the computers that can be used to analyze to say, okay, well, the this state has this population, this state has this, the people from the age zero to four are this number. People from a zero, people in the uh, uh, maternal age, that is 15 to 49, are this number. So it is computers that analyze and give all these statistics. In advanced countries, this can be used to project so many things that will happen in the future because of the depth of the information that the computer can drill and bring out. What about weather forecasts? When you, hit, when you watch a weather forecast, what is simply happening is an analysis of several years, 
several years, sometimes up to 35 years of data that the computer is armed in and is able to predict what will happen in the weather the next day, sometimes up to the next 10 days. In some countries, up to the month, they project what will happen because the computer has accumulation of this previous historical data on the climatic conditions of that area. So it's able to analyze and make sense out of it and can direct the world where the, what the weather is going to be at, the, at that point in time. There are several uses of computers. They have in crime detection. Of course, now that is why uh, they are able to track when people commit crime, they can track them even if they've committed the crime and left and escaped. They can track them because of computer following the information that computer is able to gather about such persons. They can also control crime. There are sometimes computers are used in surveillance. When computers are used in surveillance, it can report and can uh, 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 sound alarm when something is about to happen. And in advanced countries, there could be an immediate intervention. What of the transportation sector? Computers are highly deployed in transportation sector. For example, in airways, reservations, and ticketing, computers are highly useful. You go to board your flight, they take your, they take your, your ticket and put in sometimes your name alone. All your information comes out and then they're able to print your boarding pass and this is a flight you book from your room so in airways reservation and ticketing even in a railway reservation and ticketing in most european countries their airways and their railways are nearly indistinguishable they are as advanced as that in manufacturing car manufacturing now cannot function without computers cars televisions, any kind of advanced manufacturing happens with the use of computers. What of communication? There will be no GSM operation or, or, or operator in operation without the use of computers. When you dial a number and make a call, for you to be able to type the name of that person, and when you call the other person at the other end receives, is because that is a database at each end of that GSM operator that's able to identify the user you're trying to reach. And then the, the communication switches are alerted to reach out to that person. Now, you have what we call apparent disadvantages. We call them apparent because these disadvantages are not real. They're not real disadvantages. So the world looks at them as disadvantages of computers. But we can see that they, when you, at the end of the day, you see that these are not real disadvantages. The first apparent disadvantage is redundancy. Remember, computers are highly efficient and they can work very fast. So because of the efficiency and speed of operation, it is believed that people can re become redundant because of the deployment of computers. However, the solution to this kind of situation Actually, the system that is very organized. The solution to this kind of situation is that those who are apparently or supposedly redundant can be retrained and then re and de redeployed to other areas where they will be useful. So in the real sense of it, they are not redundant. They are jo they join the retraining and redeployment. Well, uh, the cost of computer, the next uh, disadvantage, uh, Apparently, is a computer cost. Uh, the cost of a computer is non-trivial. Means the cost of a computer is not like a giveaway. Yes, when you buy a computer, you know that you bought something. So, and then this cost can be so high for an average low-income earner. This cost can be so high for them. What of software? Software can also be costly if you want to buy original. You know, pirated software you can get it at give away, they can even sell it for 100 Naira. Original software goes into thousands of Naira. So, people who are the average low-income people can tell you they cannot afford a computer and they also cannot afford original software. But the reality now is that because of the miniaturization, the, the, the breaking down of computer sizes into smaller, smaller sizes like you have the tablets, which can do a lot, who can do up to Microsoft uh, Office, can run in there. You have tablets, you have netbooks. Computers are gradually, reasonably becoming affordable. 
for the average person. Now you also have the 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 gaining ground of op- free and open source software. So now there are some software a lot of them now they don't need to pay a dime to use the original. So these software now are making the cost of original software to be affordable because there are some software that are free you can ignore the original software and use the free software. So cost is no more an issue. Now there's another problem of overdependence in uh, on computers. Well most of the time people have become so used to computers so that they want to add 10 plus 15. They go to their computer and type 10 plus because their computer has a calculator. So at some point the concern is that most people would now lose their real manually acquired skills because they depend 100% on computer for everything. It can make them look like stupid because they cannot do anything without computers. But the reality is that we must understand you know that computers are assistants to us. So they cannot replace humans. And that is why they work under the control of stored instructions. So there's no time in the history of man that computers can totally replace man. So we must see computers as assistants to man and not the other way around. Now the last apparent disadvantage that people get concerned about is computer literacy, the cost of becoming a computer literate person. They believe that uh, to train how to to use a computer it must be adequately trained which is true. And that the cost of training is very high for low income uh potential users. But the reality is that there's now proliferation of computer training centers all over the country and across the world. Sometimes some of them are online and are free. So some of them that are online and are free, all you need to buy is internet and they are able to get training. The local training centers are now becoming very affordable because of competition. So the costs of training has come down drastically and now so average people can afford to register on trainings and and get trained 